fueled by Death Guest. The first segment is with retired NASA astronaut and artist Nicole Stott. This week, Dustin, we got something really fun for science, um, and I think you're not going to be scared for once. Uh, I don't know. That's that's <laughs> probably not. That's probably not possible. Um, we have our special guest, who you're going to hear later on in this episode. Um, astronaut Nicole Stott is with us, and the reason why is because I'm bringing up recently, March 30th. There was a um, very, very cool thing that happened in space, another spacewalk on the International Space Station. Um, and I thought it was really cool to have you as a part of this today, Nicole, because you actually did this as well, right? You did a couple spacewalks while you were you were up there. I did. I did only one spacewalk, which oh, okay. I can tell you, it's like, you know, the number of times you go to space, it's never enough. You know, right. you always... <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, did one and wish that I had done another because I think then maybe my brain would have remembered more of the experience. But how only long, one. <laughs> how long were you out on that spacewalk? That one, a little over six. It was a little over six and a half hours. Wow. And you were yeah. doing like the same thing that they were doing, like uh, maintenance on the space station, I believe. We were. There was a mix of maintenance and there was uh, we we one of the coolest things I got to do on the spacewalk was ride on the end of the big robotic arm, you know, like this big long path on the big robotic arm, hanging onto this box that on the ground would have weighed, (laughs) I don't know, 800 pounds or something. But up there you can just do, you know, whatever you want with it and rode on the arm with that. And that was some science experiments that we had uh, out outside of the station that were attached to the outside of the station and they needed to bring them back to earth. So we were taking it from the station down into the space shuttle. But yeah, most spacewalks are a mix of assembly, you know, building the station or maintenance or um, bringing science back to Earth. Wow. What, what were they doing uh, yesterday in particular? Uh, they were they're, they're they're getting it ready for they're 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 fitting more um, couplings and different things on it to uh, get it ready for new docking. Oh, things. Like, like an upgrade. A yeah. Upgrade and um, one of the things that happened yesterday, actually, at, at well, depending on when you're listening to this, on March 30th um, at, at, during that spacewalk was uh, a part of cloth shielding actually um, floated off. Um, and everything is tethered down like you're tethered down, Nicole, like you were saying on, on the on the big arm and all that stuff. Um, is it scary? Like, like when you things said I wasn't going to be float, scared, Jeff. Kind of float away. I'm so scared right like, now. Like, because I mean, Stop you're using gravity. You're using tools and you're using like all these different things. Everything must be tethered to you, right? Like, it did, was there ever moments for you where things kind of like almost floated off? Like, was it? Is it? I'm just so curious about stuff like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember where a moment where things almost floated off. It is. It is really easy for that to happen, though. Yeah. And not so much with your person. I think there's a diligence that uh, very deliberate uh, attention to that when you're outside with your own tethers. And we have a lifeline that we call our safety tether that goes back to a main anchor point, and then. Whenever you get to a, a particular location, just like imagine if you were rock climbing, you kind of, you know, local tether yourself so you can't get any further than four feet away from the, the structure and that kind of thing. So very deliberate there. But there, there is real opportunity for little pieces and tools to be liberated <laughs> from, their, <laughs> from their tether for, for a number of, of different reasons. And, and, you know, no crew member wants that to happen. No, I, you know, they don't want that to happen. But it's, it's kind of an accepted um, part of that work is that there is the possibility of that happening. And, uh, you know, just unfortunately, they, they experienced that yesterday, but they, they recovered beautifully. Oh, with yeah, it, they you know? MacGyvered I, away out of it. And oh, it, yeah. was, it was incredible. I, I was watching some of it live. That's what's so cool about living in the future that we live in now is, is like we can <laughs> I can watch astronauts in space working on the space station it, on facebook it, yeah it's, it's yeah. incredible <laughs> facebook live yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so absolutely weird. incredible <laughs> um the other question i wanted to ask you what is the process like you're you're in the space station and you're gonna go out on a spacewalk so you have to get in your suit and and get out there like how, what is that process like is it does it take a long time to what, get what theme music is playing <laughs> when this is happening <laughs> right <laughs> There is always music. I wish, you know, I wish I could remember what music was playing when we were suiting up. There was, somebody's always got music going on on the station. There, you know, it's a, um, again, a very deliberate, scripted uh, process yeah. to, to go out the door. And 
And there's communication with our ground team. They are, they're working along right beside us on the checklist for any of the people that are helping get the crew members that are going outside ready to, to go out. Um, but, and, and it works beautifully. There's, it's scripted so nicely that you, if you do miss something, you catch it down the way. I mean, and it, it's really a, a, a great process, um, but it takes a while. I mean, it's, it's a few hours of, of wow. getting ready to go out. And these days we do something called a, an, an exercise protocol before, before going out the door where, um, before you get in the suit, you actually get on an oxygen mask and you ride the bike at, you know, the, the bike at a certain level, um, for a while. And that's to help get rid of that nitrogen in your body. You want to prevent the bends from happening just yeah. like you would if you were going out on, you know, on an extended dive. Wow. And so it used to be that we would sleep overnight in, in the airlock at a reduced um, pressure to, to help get that nitrogen out of your body. Oh. But this is where it's so neat. I mean, how technology and what we know about our bodies, what we've learned on the ground from, you know, from deep sea diving kinds of things and what we know from doing earlier spacewalks, we've developed easier techniques for ridding ourselves of that nitrogen in our body to make it easier to get out the door too. And, um, but it's, it's a process and you want it to be a process because you want all of the ceiling surfaces to be holding the pressure in the suit and you want, you know, you want it to work when you go outside. In, In my line of work, I feel like we put in procedures because we've kind of messed it up already. (laughs) I mean, does that, does that happen for you guys where it's like, Oh, this didn't work. That, that was a mistake. <laughs> we probably should put a procedure in, in process so we so we don't do that again. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 that's that's a good thing. I mean, there's yeah. the good there's the good and the bad of that. There's the good in it that you should very deliberately be learning from the lessons that you've had before. You know, you shouldn't have to do that, make that mistake again. And so we do try, you know, as much as we can to incorporate those lessons learned. What you don't want to do is bog yourself down with so much other, you know, procedural stuff that it opens up new opportunities for making mistakes. So there's a a really, yeah, yeah, really interesting balance there. Awesome. Uh, The final question is, uh, we talked about getting out there, but you're you're out in space, you said for like, you know, six hours or whatever. Um, when you come back into the space station, is it a, is, is it like an acclimation process? Like does your, is it, does it take your body a little bit? Like, is it different from being in space to being back in the space station or is it kind of like an easy transition? It really is a pretty easy transition. I think once you get back in the airlock, you know, there's the, the procedures. I mean, it's all very scripted and checklisted mm-hmm. again, you know, to bring you back in. You don't want to hurt yourself you know, pulling the helmet off and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's, it's, uh, it's much quicker than going out the door. And it's kind of like, you know, when you really work hard at anything and you finally get to get all the equipment off, you get to, you know, think about just chilling and relaxing yeah. afterwards. That's, that's where it's just kind of this wind down because when you're out on a spacewalk, it's, you know, there is the physical aspect of it. There's the, wow, look, I am outside in my own little spaceship, really. Yeah. You know, I've got my own little visor. You know, it's just between this this and between me and, you know, 250 miles below me, that beautiful planet again. That, by the way, is a distraction. So you got to kind of look away from that. Wow. Or you'd just be looking at that the yeah. whole time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. mesmerizing. Doing your job. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a, you know, there's a, there's kind of a mental, you know, you're working hard mentally when you're out there too. Yeah. And so it is, a. Uh, you come back in, you've successfully gotten your work done and you're exhausted you want one probably, of, right? You want one of these, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, you want to chill a little bit. Yeah. Do you drink, do you drink coffee in space? Yes, you do. Oh. How, how do we, how do we get death wish to space? <laughs> <How do> we... <laughs> you know what? Let's talk about that. I think people okay. would love it. Awesome. So. Great. <laughs> I am so into that. Awesome. <laughs> we'll, we'll, Jeff and I, and you will be responsible for putting death wish in space. That's I love amazing. It. Yeah. Well, this yeah. was officially the, the coolest science segment we've ever had. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank Nicole. you. Thank you. Thanks for the interest. The next segment is with theoretical physicist and best-selling author, Dr. Michio Kaku. So uh, back to your book, <clears throat> you talk a lot about the implications of getting to Mars and then terraforming it to make it uh, habitable for humans. Do you 
do you see a future where we're able to grow crops on Mars like we do on Earth, uh, like we've seen in recent uh, science fiction movies? I think one of the first things we're going to do on Mars is to try to create an agriculture on Mars. We're going to genetically modify algae, genetically modify plants. Plants love carbon dioxide, and the atmosphere of Mars is carbon dioxide, but it's cold. So we have to heat up Mars a bit. If we could eject, for example, methane gas, that could create an artificial greenhouse effect, or satellites. Solar satellites can beam energy to the polar ice caps, melt them to create rivers. Mars once had an ocean about the size of the United States. That's how big that ocean used to be billions of years ago. We could recreate it by melting the polar ice caps. And if we can raise the temperature by six degrees, just six degrees, the atmosphere could take off. We could have a runaway greenhouse effect to raise the temperature of Mars if we can raise it just six degrees. And, and how, do we, how do we go about implementing that? Well, Elon Musk, the, the genius behind SpaceX and all the recent uh, news about moon rockets, uh, Elon Musk said casually, maybe we can drop a hydrogen bomb on the polar ice caps to melt, melt them. <laughs> I think that's a little bit premature because who wants to drink radioactive water? Right. But I think solar cells and solar satellites can beam energy to the polar ice caps to accelerate the process of heating it up. So a combination of methane gas, a combination of beaming energy to the polar ice caps could start this runaway greenhouse effect to make Mars into another Garden of Eden. Wow. I find it interesting that you um, are more focused on changing, you know, the planet temperature and terraforming Mars than I feel like it would be easier to um, make uh, plants that, you know, uh, kind of change their genome so that they grow better in a Mars, you know, eco uh, e system. So instead of changing the planet, change the plants. Uh, yeah, I think definitely we should genetically modify algae so that they would consume carbon dioxide on a very vast scale because the atmosphere is almost pure carbon dioxide and also thrive in a cold environment. Mars is a frozen desert. It's frozen solid. And so we have to find a way for plants to grow in a very cold environment. So initially, we'll have to create hydroponics. That is, we'll have to create uh, gigantic factories producing the first plants to create topsoil. But once that gets off the ground, I think we're going to have to heat up large areas of Mars so that plants can exist that will proliferate on their own. Okay? So I think definitely we want to jumpstart this technology to create agribusiness on Mars by using biotechnology. And how far away do you think we are from doing something like this? Uh, well, let's get a timetable. Uh, first of all, next year, 2019, the first moon rocket will go back to the moon after a 50-year gap. The SLS booster rocket of NASA and the Orion space capsule are scheduled to orbit around the moon in the unmanned mission in December of 2019. Then 2023, humans, astronauts, will go back to the moon. And then by 2026, we hope to have a lunar orbiter that orbits the moon to create a rocket ship that will take us to Mars. So the moon is going to be a halfway stop. We'll stop on the moon. It's only three days away by rocket. Build the Mars ship in space and then shoot the Mars rocket to Mars for a two-year journey. That will take place sometime around 2030, 2035. And then once we get that off the ground, a small settlement of astronauts will be created uh, and perhaps by the end of the century, perhaps we'll have a few hundred colonists on Mars. Elon Musk envisions a million colonists, each rocket containing maybe a thousand settlers and colonists to begin the process of creating a second branch of humanity. Now, of course, all humans are not going to go to Mars, a settlement on Mars, because we need an insurance policy in case something happens to the Earth. Now, remember, the dinosaurs had no space program. And True. because the dinosaurs had no space program, that's why they're not here today to talk about it. We do have a space program, so we can create 
a insurance policy, a backup plan, plan B, in case something bad happens to the Earth. Wow. Um, and getting to Mars, we're going to terraform it. I have to ask this question here at Death Wish Coffee. Um, would we be able to grow coffee on Mars? Yes. In principle, anything that could be grown on the Earth can be modified slightly to grow in the environment of Mars, which is colder than the Earth, but still has plenty of carbon dioxide. Plants love carbon dioxide. So, yes, you could have coffee on Mars. And it would uh, we, we tout ourselves as the world's strongest coffee. Would caffeine affect you differently in the atmosphere of Mars, or would it be the same? I think it would be largely the same because... Uh, you know, caffeine will get into blood, and the blood goes into the brain and stimulates dopamine. And so I think that for the most part, for the most part, it'll be roughly the same. You can still get the caffeine high on Mars. That, that, that's good, because as I said, we, we are the world's strongest coffee, and we hope to one day be the strongest coffee in the universe. And uh, that would be our mm -hmm. first steps. The next segment is with activist, entrepreneur, and author Claire Wineland. You touched on it a little bit, how you were saying, you know, you felt that there needed to be a voice um, for people who are sick. And you also have this, this wonderful strength to you. Um, and I, I really wanted to kind of ask you, where do you, draw, where do you draw your strength from? And I'm not talking about in the sense of, of that you are sick and you're going to die, but from the sense of that um, you are faced every day with people, like you said, unloading their pity and their feelings on you. Where do you, where do you find that strength to kind of overcome that and be positive? Honestly, I find a lot of it, and it sounds weird, but I find a lot of it in science. I'm a, I'm a big nerd. We are too. Um, we are too, big time. Oh, good. Thank God. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, for me, some of the, and I, I, you know, my dad is a very spiritual person. I was raised very kind of Tibetan Buddhist and, uh -huh. and kind of grew up reading those kind of things. And those do do a lot for me as well, you know, but I think where I've kind of had the most uh, aha moments in my life has been through learning about how everything works, why it works the way it does. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, there's so much complexity in everything if you know how to look at it right. You know what I mean? If you yeah. know, if you know what's going on under the surface, there's so much complexity to it. Even a, you know, I mean, even like a, even a, a, a dew drop. Um, you know, if you like go, do, if you zoom in deep enough to the dew drop, there's whole organisms playing out their entire life and their and their their battles and their wars and their you know relationships and all of that. There's like thousands of organisms in a dew drop living their life. There's the actual chemical makeup of the water. There's the you know there's the leaf that it's sitting on and the way that it's turning sunlight into energy and all that's crazy and you would never think twice about it. It's just another dew drop. You know, so for right. me, it's kind of you zoom in deep enough to any life, to any form of life, and you find complexity. And I kind of applied that to my own life, that it's small, it's short, um, and it's, you know what I mean? And, it, and it's not as, I don't have as broad of possibilities as some do, um, because I don't have health. But you zoom in deep enough, you look at it the right way, and there's still just as much life going on. There's still just as much complexity and beauty and, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and intricacy, intricacy, really. And and like and like it's and so I'm very much kind of a microcosm macro you kind of person you know like yeah. like um, the same laws that govern the universe kind of govern us and I think that that's beautiful and I think a lot of the times I think some of the best best advice I ever got um, around being sick and and kind of you know moving forwards with life because honestly I don't think it's just a sick person thing. I think everyone has a really, really hard time just going about life <laughs> because we're kind of sold this notion that like it's way more glamorous than it is. Yeah. Uh, and most of most of life is just mundane stuff. It's just like, you know, going to the bathroom and then doing the dishes, you know, like that's the majority of life is just really <laughs> mundane. And it's like, it's like, it's like we're all just like, it's like this mental gymnastics of like trying to get ourselves to do the same things every day. Um, so I think some of the best kind of advice I ever got for how to just move forward and just do it is that you're not that important 
Yeah. You're not that important. And, 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 and I mean that in like a loving way. Like, you know what I mean? Like my, me being sick, that's not that big of a deal. I'm not that important. I have something to give. I have something to offer. And, uh, you know what I mean? And, and I, I can make something for the world out of my experience and out of what I've been through. I have something to share. And that can be important. That can have its own, a life of its own, you know? Yeah. But me, myself, my own like head is not that important. So I don't need to like dwell on it for a million hours um and i that just that kind of helps so much because the moment you stop fucking sorry oh, i don't no, know no, if we're to cuss. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, cuss. I'm such a cusser Cut it always, it always comes it out, out. <laughs> <laughs> um but you know what i mean the moment you stop just kind of going in that endless loop of like i don't know you know what you're doing wrong how your life isn't where you want it to be how can you get it to where you want it to be and then you know what I mean? like right. once you kind of get out of that and you step back and you're like all right this is everything's really crazy and we are somehow like alive and conscious and it's really weird and you take a step back and realize you're just an organism you know like it, it takes a lot of the weight off your chest the next segments are with dr michio kaku and bill farmer the voice of disney's goofy all of what you do has touched so many people in the world and uh, you know from all walks of life and it's because of the way that you can you know explain the intricacies of science and what you're talking about and it harkens back to that quote from Einstein um, and speaking of cartoons uh, one of those people happens to be Bill Farmer who happens to be the voice of Goofy uh, Mickey Mouse's friend in all of Disney's adaptations he's one of your biggest fans and uh, also um, a friend of our show and he wanted to ask you a question Michio, I'm Bill Farmer. Uh, you might know me as the voice of Goofy. Gorge. Someone's got to do it. And I'm a big fan. And I have a question. In the world we know, classical physics is the law of the land. In the subatomic world, quantum mechanics and a whole different set of rules takes over. Let's say I was shrinking. How far would I have to shrink until I would leave this world of classical physics and become trapped by the world of quantum mechanics is there like a state line where we move from one to the other well gee that's a tough question <laughs> um it used to be that people like niels bohr the founder of the quantum, one of the founders of the quantum theory believed that there was a wall a wall that separated the microscopic world which is bizarre uh, people, things can exist in multiple states simultaneously. Electrons can disappear, reappear, be in parallel states simultaneously. That bizarre world of the quantum is separated us by a wall because we live in a microscopic world where you can only be one place at one time. Forget being multiple places at multiple times simultaneously. Well, now we know there is no wall. We think that Niels Bohr was wrong, that uh, nanotechnology allows a smooth, a smooth transition between quantum mechanical things and large things. So then, how do we then smoothly go from one world, the world where things can pop into existence out of nothing, and the world of today where a rock is a rock is a rock. A rock doesn't disappear. A rock doesn't turn into light. At the subatomic level, rocks can turn into light. That rock is uranium. That light is a nuclear bomb. And at the subatomic level, you can have all sorts of goofy things uh, <laughs> happening. And we now know there, there is no brick wall. It's continuous. Nanotechnology has given us the ability to smoothly manipulate individual atoms. And then the question is, well, if universes can exist in simultaneous forms, then is Elvis Presley still alive in a quantum parallel universe? And the answer could be, well, yes. Uh, Elvis Presley could still be alive, but why can't we talk to him? If that's subatomically possible, why can't we do it in real life, talk to Elvis Presley? Well, quantum mechanics says that everything's vibrating. When things vibrate in unison, that's called coherence, then they can interact with each other quantum mechanically. But after a while, they start to vibrate not in unison, and that's called incoherence, and that's the world of today. Our world today is incoherent. That's why we cannot talk to Elvis Presley. We're no longer vibrating at the same frequency. If we were vibrating at the same frequency as Elvis Presley, then yeah, we could talk to him. But we're not. We have decohered from him. And that's a separation. The longer you wait, the more the vibration and the waves separate. And that's why you can no longer 
communicate between two parallel universes. So it's a smooth continuation. It's not abrupt like we once thought. Wow. Very cool. Uh, on, speaking on interstellar space travel, the universe seems so vast and sometimes so unreachable. And actually, this was a second question that we got from Goofy, uh, voice actor Bill Farmer. Um, again, like I said, he's one of your biggest fans. The universe started as a single point of the Big Bang. It's been growing until now we see stars 8, 13 billion light years distant. That means that that light's been traveling for 13 billion years. Well, doesn't that mean that that star that we're seeing that light from is now at least like 26 billion or even farther away? So how can the universe be only 13 point something billion years old? Well, the farthest stars that we can observe are roughly 12, 12 and a half uh, billion light years from us. And that still means that the universe is older than the oldest stars that we can see in the universe. It used to be the opposite. Uh, years ago, our measurements were not very precise, and the age of a star can be measured by calculating how fast it burns hydrogen. The age of stars was larger than the age of the universe. That was very embarrassing, because, of course, the universe has to be older than its stars. Now the numbers are in agreement. The numbers say that the oldest stars can be maybe 12 billion, maybe 12 and a half billion years old, but the universe itself is over 13 billion years old. So the numbers agree now, which is very nice. Wow, that's incredible. The next segment is with retired NASA astronaut and artist Nicole Stott. I mean, I was just going to say that I, 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 I love that you guys are aware, too. You know, I, I mean, part of my, as a, a retired astronaut now, you know, I think everybody that, that leaves the office and goes on to something new, like mm -hmm. the new adventure, whatever that's going to be. I mean, for me, that's, that's based on art and, uh, you know, sharing the experience through my artwork and communicating with audiences that might not even know we have a space station. And there are a lot of people out there that don't know that we have for the past 16 years. I mean, honestly, as long as my son has been alive, we have been living peacefully, successfully, quietly, even, you know, off our planet for yeah. 16 years. People circling every 90 minutes on that space station. And that's a pretty impressive thing. It really Especially is. with, you know, like we said, the relationships that made that happen, not to mention the technology that has been developed to allow that to happen, but also that everything we're doing up there it's helping us explore, live in space and off our planet, but it is ultimately about improving life here on Earth. Yes. And that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, that's a pretty cool thing. It's, it's amazing. It really is. And uh, for the last, I don't know, uh, handful of years uh, with uh, smartphone technology and stuff like that, I have an app on my phone that tells me every time the space station goes over my head, and I always wave because it's always cool to be able to see it as, it, as, it's, as, it's, as it's going. <laughs> Um, so you went I up there. I think when you think about people up there, that's pretty impressive. It really you know, is. It, yeah, yeah. You know, that little dot of light has six people from around the world on it. Yeah, yeah that's so pretty cool. Neat. So you went up there for the first time. So ask a question. I keep interrupting you. Oh no, no, no. no, no. no. It's okay. in, in in 2009 is when you went up there for the first time. Um, and I, here's a question I've always wanted to ask: How long does it actually take from liftoff on the ground to actually get to the space station? Well, to get to the space station, when we flew on the space shuttle, uh -huh. it was about it was about two days. But that's because we just we planned the whole, you know, chasing down the space station that way, right, and we yeah. did it deliberately. We could have gotten there quicker. I mean, the orbital mechanics of it all would allow you to get there quicker. Uh -huh. In fact, our Soyuz, our, our Russian partners with the Soyuz spacecraft, they do a what they call a four orbit rendezvous now, and basically six hours from the time you launch to when you're docked with the space station. Wow. Um, and, and they used to do the, uh, the two-day thing as well. But the, the importance of the two-day thing was get to orbit, which only takes eight and a half minutes on the, on the shuttle. Wow. You know, we launched in eight and a half minutes, you're circling Earth. Whoa. Uh, you know, and then the point was to, you know, very deliberately on a path, chase down the station, and along the way, you would open up your payload bay doors and make sure that, you know, that those systems were working, deploy the big antenna and make sure all the communications were working. 
Yeah. So do a very, a very thorough checkout of the space shuttle before you docked it to another, you know, another piece of big hardware in space. Seems like a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And it's, and it, it gives you a little time to adapt to where you are and get to know the shuttle or, you know, a little bit better before you're docked with the station. <laughs> and, um, but, but yeah. And, and then on the way home, you know, you could undock and be home in an hour if, uh, you know, if you wanted to, but, um, wow. Why would you want to come home that quickly? Right. Yeah. No way. <laughs> so wait, how long did it take to come back then for you? Well, we we undock from the station and then there's usually about a day before you um, close the payload bay doors and then burn the engines to come back into the atmosphere. So uh, it, it was typically about a day. But I think on my first flight, we actually I think on both flights, we um, delayed a day coming home for weather at, at KSC and so had an extra day in space because of that, which, you know. None of us looked against each other and complained about that at all. Right. That was yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, I got to ask, too. You were one of the last crew members to actually um, come back on the space shuttle. Um, is is it a little scary coming coming in and on space shuttle? Like, I, I mean, you, you know, we see it uh, romanticized in Hollywood movies and stuff like that. But like in real life, is that is it? Is it what is it like to I'm, come back into I'm the scared? Yeah. Into I'm the, scared into the atmosphere. To it. My palms are sweaty. It <laughs> yeah. doesn't take much. But that's it, man. And now, you know, the space shuttle, what was uh, the space shuttle? I hope we figure out how to do something as beautiful as the space shuttle again. You know, yeah. the space shuttle launched from a launch pad and glided in to landing uh-huh. on the runway. And, you know, the launch on the shuttle was really dynamic. I mean, yeah. m- m- more than I, after watching launches for years working out there, ever imagined. I mean, I thought it was going to be like here and, you know, I can't even stretch my arm high enough right, right. for how, you know, your body is like jello shaking oh, on, the, on the way up. And, <laughs> um, but it's outstanding. And, you know, just a little detour here, but the on launch, uh, the nothing prepares you for it, I don't think. And then you do it again thinking, oh, you know, been there, done that. And it's like a whole new experience all over again. Oh, and God. I don't know if our engineers who designed the shuttle did this deliberately or not. But in about the first minute and a half, there's not a whole lot the crew can do, you know, about anything. You right. monitor systems. There's, you know, some things, you know, immediate switches you can throw and stuff. But for the most part, you're in monitor mode. And and I think that was such a good thing because that first minute and a half, it goes by so quickly. And the whole time you're just like the smile is across your face yeah. inside the helmet. You're high fiving with the guy <laughs> next to you and you know, woohooing and stuff because it just I think it just drives it out of you. It's about you know, I'm talk about human experience. Oh, I mean, it gosh. just comes out of you then. And so that that's really dynamic on the shuttle. The the landing on a space shuttle was it was like graceful and peaceful and and yeah, it, and it was almost kind of this contrast because, you know, once you start entering the atmosphere and if you could get a view out a window, I mean, you're seeing that heat and um you know some of the plasma yeah. kind of moving across the vehicle that you're like oh wow it is really hot out there <laughs> <laughs> and you know you're going super fast and and but it just was inside you know just a little bit of a rumble every now and then but no you know no dynamics at all like like launch and then when you land it's just this circling kind of s turn and spiral into the runway and and you're gliding you're not even on engines anymore i mean you know wow. the key there is you got one you know it's one time you right. land you're going around and it was just this you know little screechy noise on the runway and then your home it was so so mellow yeah wow that's crazy <laughs> uh, you yeah. have you the thing that's most inspiring Uh, about you for me is that you have this perfect dichotomy of like cheerfulness and positivity teamed up with like like a bold and fearlessness where where do you get that from that's amazing (laughs) I don't know my mom and dad both very cool you know and uh, I think the the opportunity to be out there that that my parents shared what they were excited about with us was 
I think a really huge thing. Uh, we, we're trying to do that with with my son as well. Uh, you know, in fact, like when we when I flew the first time, that you know that three years of training, he was seven when I flew wow. the first time. And so this kid, his whole life has been, you know, mom traveling back and forth to other countries and trying to take him when I could and getting yeah. him out to whatever. You know, if we were doing training where you're in the orange suits or the big white suit or in a simulator, you know, I tried to get him to as much of that as possible. So he was part of the crew. And that's the way I felt with, you know, with my family. I mean, I felt like I was part of the crew. And if somebody enjoyed something, they shared it with you. And uh, I think that kind of gets in your blood that way. And very thankful to my dad for the passion he had for flying. I mean, my gosh, I don't know. I hope that I would have found that some other way, but I don't know if I would have or not. Would you yeah. call yourself an adrenaline junkie? Um, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I don't know. You know, or I don't know. You know, maybe there's certain things that I think I like doing that other people think like, holy moly, why would you ever yeah, you know, nope. do that? <laughs> yeah. But put me at the edge of a cliff or drive me on one of those roads in Europe where there's no railing and, oh, you know, yeah. I just... Over the Skyway Bridge, I don't want, I really don't want anything to do with it. That, there's particular things, I guess. Okay, but that's surprising. Stuff, yeah, that's <laughs> a little surprising. I mean, you have been to space. <laughs> well, you know, there's, everybody says that. How can you be afraid of heights if you've, you know, been to space? You did a spacewalk. How can you be afraid of heights and things? Like that? It is totally different. Yeah. It is totally different. And, and maybe it's a naive trust in your equipment or something. I don't uh. know, but. Standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon with no protection, nothing is very different to me to going out on a spacewalk in a spacesuit that's designed to protect you. Right. Do you think that's uh, because uh, you were on part of the engineering operational logistics side that you were able to put that trust in your equipment? I, you know, when it all, when it came down to flying on the shuttle, actually going out there, strapping in and launching, I had you know, total confidence in the team that had put that vehicle together. Yep. And that's not to say that there's not risk associated with it because right. we all know there is. That's not to say that there's something that was not humanly possible for them to deal with or that got missed because we are human beings doing yeah. this. Yeah. But to the best, you know, to the best degree possible, I knew that those folks were doing what they could to make this a safe vehicle. And so that was definitely part of the, the comfort zone. And, and when people ask me, was I scared? Was I afraid to go launch on the shuttle? I'm like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't fear. It wasn't being afraid. It was, I was anxious. I mean, I'm like, I want to know what this is. I've been training for a long time to do this. I know the people that worked on this vehicle and I am anxious to see what it's going to feel like. And to get up there and do work that I believe is important as well. Yeah, that's really cool. And uh, <laughs> one of the questions we had actually from uh, another one of our employees, which I thought was pretty funny, um, with all the, you know, the, all the different um, operations on the on the shuttle and all the bells and whistles and everything when you're you're getting up to the space station. Uh, our our uh, our buddy John here wanted me to ask you: Is there does the shuttle have a horn? Do you, do, can you, can you, can you beep at, at the, at the space station when you get up there? <laughs> well, you could, but I don't know if that sound would travel through that's space true, in a way that true, would make it true. to them. But, um, we do have it. That's, it's a good question though, because, know over, it's not. you know, it is over our calm, you know, we're, we're alerting them in some yeah, way the yeah. entire time we're approaching. Yeah. And then kind of in line with that, you know, it wasn't a horn, but you know how the Navy on ships has this when, when, um, an officer is arriving or departing, they have this bell they ring or when another ship is departing yeah. or arriving, they have this bell they ring. We have one of those bells on the space station. And so when the shuttle or any vehicle would dock and, you know, a crew would be ready to come on board, they would ring the bell to announce that you were arriving. And then after we'd undock, they would ring the bell and go through this kind of ceremonial, traditional, just departure thing to say, hey, you know, safe, safe trip home. You know, that's so cool. Space shuttle discovery departing. Yeah. How often were people coming in and out? Uh, you know, it's not that often. I uh, probably in the every three to six month 
timing. With shuttle, it was probably about every three to six months. With with us not flying shuttle now and the Soyuz being the vehicle that's getting us to and from station, mm-hmm. um, that's actually timing's about the same, I guess, because we rotate crews. They, they're usually up there from like a four to six month for a four to six month mission. And so we're overlapping and rotating crews um, throughout, but probably three months for people showing up. Wow. And you were up there your first time for just over three months. Um, and you were saying that the space station, you know, a- actually goes around the Earth every 90 minutes. Um, yeah. Do the days kind of blend together? Like how did like I, I've always wondered, like um, is living in the space station, what it's like to like go to sleep. Yeah. Sleeping like, must be like, so weird. Is, it, is, is that tough to get used to? Like S- sleeping is outstanding, you know, because on the space station, each of us have our own personal crew compartments about okay. the size of a phone booth. And it is the best sleep I've ever had in wow. my entire life, wow. quite honestly. It's, you know, you stick your sleeping bag up on the wall and you float into it. And <laughs> there's no, I mean, literally, there's no pressure points. You're not like having to roll around to get comfortable and stuff. And it really was like the first couple, first couple nights in space are a little difficult because you you just don't know how to, your body doesn't know how to respond to that almost. Yeah. And and when you get to the microgravity environment, there's no load, you know, no gravity pulling your own body down anymore. So your spine elongates a little bit. And so I grew a little over an inch while I was there just because your spine completely offloads. Wow. And um, and that hurts a little bit. It's like lower back pain. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, you're trying to get just like down here, you're trying to get comfortable when your back hurts, you know, to sleep. Yeah. But then it just goes away. It's just gone. Wow. And and it is the most, I would get in my sleeping bag, shut the door, turn, you know, do a little Sudoku puzzle for, <laughs> you know, a couple minutes or something, um, stick it back on the wall, turn the light off. And I think within five minutes every night I was asleep and wow. I did not, I mean, I woke up in the same position wow. to the alarm, whether that was a, you know, emergency alarm or the, or the, you know, alarm on my watch going off to tell me it was time to get up. It was so comfortable you must have had the most crazy dreams up in space you know they change they do change i um i found and they changed for me down here after getting back too Wow. i found that like before i flew i used to have these dreams all the time and i remember as a kid too having these dreams where you know you kind of run and jump to fly you know just Mm -hmm. to be able to fly on your own and sometimes I could, and sometimes I couldn't in my dreams. And I know there's probably some psychology to that of, you know, struggling with something or whatever. I, if you couldn't get or a test, you're going to fail. I don't know. Right. But, um, but in space, I, I never had those dreams. And I started, dreaming started to incorporate, you know, things that were happening in space too. You know, those activities, that feeling, floating, all of that. And then when, since coming home, I've never had that run and jump dream anymore. You're free I've, now. I've never, <laughs> no more I've, I've, I've been, Yes. But I, I think it's because, uh, maybe it's because your body knows, your brain yeah. knows what it feels like to do that and doesn't have to, um, you know, fight it anymore. Did you use yeah. like uh, flotation tanks for training at all? It sounds like that would be useful. Well, for, for spacewalks, we use a, this ginormous pool in, in Houston. There's this pool called the, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, and yeah. it's like 100 feet wide, 200 feet long, and 40 feet deep, and it's got a full mock-up of the space station in it. And it's not, and they can't lay it out in the same configuration as the station, but they have all of the pieces are in there. So you get into the same big 300-pound white suit, Um, and get into the pool and they get you as neutrally buoyant as possible. And you go through that whole same six and a half hour spacewalk there like you would if you were in space, Wow! but it's just a lot harder in in the pool space. And so that's really the only like buoyancy, um, training that we do. Um, a couple times during your training, you'll get to fly on the the zero G airplane, the vomit comet, (laughs) you know, to see just what it feels like to float that, that though really doesn't give you any indication of how you will feel when you get to space. It's just little bird, the burst. And, but, but it's cool to do it. (laughs) That's cool. Um, 
so you were up there, and I mean, I just I can't imagine being able to look upon the earth from that vantage point. Um, is there is there was there any um I don't know p- part of the earth that was more beautiful than the other? Like I mean, I've seen a lot of your photos and and stuff like that. But like anything that you think back on where it's just like, I can't believe I got to see this, this point of the earth from this vantage point kind of thing. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it is, the earth is stunning. I just, you know, you know, before you go from the pictures and videos that yeah. it is going to be, there's no doubt. I mean, you, you, you don't have any question about whether it's going to be pretty looking out the window, but it's, it's kind of like that launch thing here versus, you know, here with what right. it really is. And It just glows. It's like you've taken a light bulb and just painted it with all the colors that, you know, earth is, and it's just crystal clear glows like that. And, um, for me, and I think, and I actually behind the, behind my Skype screen here, I have the picture. It's like a, the, like the horizon of the planet with Florida and then the Bahamas and all that tropical water there. And I really think, even though I'm a Florida girl, where, Uh you know, I might have a little bit of a prejudice towards Florida (laughs) being the most beautiful, I can tell you that that water and that whole stretch of the planet from the southern tip of Florida to the northern coast of South America, as a single place, is probably the most beautiful place on Earth. That's, but you can't, I mean, every place, every place you yeah. look, there's a surprise that's, that's interesting. There's a, this little tiny heart island in the Red Sea that just, this naturally shaped heart island out there. And, you know, these expanses of salt lakes in Australia that look like pink, I mean, they just look like a George O'Keefe painting almost, like they painted pink flowers on the ground. and. Wow. It, you know, it's just the patterns of the dunes in the, you know, in the, the Sahara that look like bird, like bird prints, you know, bird footprints across wow. the, the earth. It's just incredible. And I think to me, I just remember looking out the window thinking, you know, God must have a really wonderful sense of humor <laughs> because I mean, all these things, it's like, why are they there? You know, why is there a little heart shaped Island out in the middle of the red sea? I mean, naturally, you know, there's a lot right. of man made Palm Island and all that stuff. Yep, that's yep. man made. But I mean, these are naturally, occurring things that you look out and you're like, wow, that's, it's like, it's meant to be there for us to discover it. And, you know, that was pretty cool to me because every time you'd look out the window, there'd be something like that. Even if you were looking at the same place, there was something surprising about it, whether it was the way the clouds were, if it was night versus day, all of that kind of thing that just, I, I can't imagine it's ever getting to the point where we're pu- pulling the shade down on the space station to, you know, watch the movie or something, you know, right. I, it's, <laughs> wow, that's so you know, why, cool. why would you not want to look out the window? Yeah. yeah. And, and that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, you are the first person to paint in space, um, and, you know, painting from what you saw and, and things. What is that like? Did like, I'm, I'm really curious, like what kind of paint did you use and how does it stick? To the canvas in microgravity <laughs> like how does that work <laughs> it was really fun you know and I, I i i always put a shout out to my crew member bob thirst because he took he took the one and only picture i have of painting in space mm-hmm. and and i wish i'll tell you if i if i were to go back i would take that watercolor kit again or i'd find it because i didn't bring it home with me and and do it again and videotape what it was like to work with the water and the paint and you know how you had to organize yourself because everything floats away yeah. so you gotta you gotta you know have velcro on everything and be really organized about it but um i didn't do that so uh, i do try to <laughs> try to describe it but it was really fun and i think in the end it turned out like most things up there they're different than the way you have to do it down here. And that's like everything, you know, going to the bathroom, leveraging yourself, working on things. It's different, but it's not necessarily more difficult than it is down here. And, and to me, that's all part of the adventure. Why would you want it to be all exactly like what you do down here when right. you're in space? You know, it seems like and it would be more difficult. That's surprising. It was it was um, it was interesting because, you know, you just can't have a bowl of water right, to, yeah. to rush in and. Uh, and, but it was, it could have been a really cool, like science demonstration too, just to show the, you know, the characteristics of like surface tension and, um, 
you know, and viscosity and things like that while you're painting, because the brush, um, I would squirt out of my drink bag. We have these like Capri Sun kind of bags with a, a straw and a little valve on the end. And so uh -huh. you could squirt out just this tiny little ball of water and then take the brush and you just touch the tip of the brush into the water and just sucks it like right into the brush. Weird. And, and then you look, I remember looking at the tip of the brush and it was like, normally down here, you know, it's like just a glob of water that's all mixed in with the, with the brush. You don't really notice any difference, but the, up there, you could see almost this ball of water just floating around the bristles of the brush. And, and then I had the watercolor kit I had was just one of those little ones with the hard paint, like a kid's yeah, kit. Yeah, you know? and, that's what I was imagining. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, and so I just took the water, mushed it around on the, on, the, on the paint, the hard paint. And then it would, as soon as I started to pull the brush away, it would suck that colored water into the brush again. And then I had watercolor paper, and it was like the same thing. It's like the paper wanted it then. As soon as you touch the brush oh, to the paper, wow. the paper would suck it up onto the thing. That sounds it, so satisfying. It was really neat. <laughs> yeah. It was really neat, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it was totally surprising to me that I was the first person to paint its face. I mean, it never crossed my mind when I went up there. Somebody told me afterwards. I'm like, really? Seriously? How can that, how can that be? Because we had... We've had people play musical instruments up there. Yeah. We have people, you know, really very talented photographers doing different things with, you know, the pictures that they're taking. And uh, and we had it, Alexei Leonov, one of the, the first Russian cosmonauts, was the first person to draw in space. He took colored pencils and drew like an orbital sunrise. And then he sketched all of his all of his crew members you know, that he was up there with and but so to think that nobody else had painted before was really very surprising yeah. to me. The last segment is with Death Wish Coffee Company founder and owner, Mike Brown. Mike, we're so excited we can finally talk about this. Like, did you ever think that you would create a product that would then go to space? No, and I never, and I still don't even, I can't even visualize it now or conceptualize that it's happened. I mean, it was all you. <laughs> you you put that together from from day one, and I, I didn't even understand it, but it's going to be uh, these astronauts are going to be drinking Death Wish coffee. It's crazy. Je I, Jeff, give us the rundown. Of all right. Exactly so I never thought it, anything would come of it other than if you're a fan of this show, you can go back to episode 18 and listen to when we talked to retired NASA astronaut Nicole Stott, one of my favorite episodes we've done of this show got to talk to her about One of the all favorite of, conversations of my life yeah got period. to talk to her all about being in space what it was like to become an astronaut and she was uh, in space for over a hundred days on the international space station and we talked about um what it was like to do a spacewalk she did a spacewalk and was out um it's like a six hour ordeal yeah like. she was outside of the space station for hours and she was like you know that it was so amazing you know being out there and doing all that and then it's tiring when you come back in because it takes you almost an hour and a half to get out of the spacesuit to get it, you know, all the components all done. And and you're so focused for the hours being in space and then coming out, focusing on getting out of the spacesuit. She's like, the first thing I want is a cup of coffee. And I said to her, and this is on the episode. And Both I said Jeff to her, I and like, I were like, oh. I was like, do you even drink coffee in space? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we de definitely drink coffee in space. And Dustin said, well, what do you what do you think it would it would we'd have to do to get Death Wish in space? And she's like, I think astronauts would love that. We should talk about that. And that was the birth of the idea. But we never were like, that was our mission. Our mission was never like, let's get Death Wish to space. We became friends with Nicole after having her on the show, and I would talk to her from time to time and send her coffee. And she got some of her colleagues um you know, into the Death Wish coffee and stuff like that. And we would just, you know, talk about coffee in space all the time. And I never was like, get our coffee into space. You know, I never would like, it never was a conversation like that. We would always just reminisce about her being on the show. And one of her good friends who happens to be an astronaut and a coffee lo lover, Serena, is part of Expedition 56 in the International Space Station. And because she's going up, friends and family of the astronauts get to send care packages to the astronauts on the space station, which I think is great. It's yeah. like creature comforts of home. You know, it's pictures of your loved ones or or your favorite stuffed animal or your favorite food or drink or stuff like that. And Nicole was like, well, I know my friend loves coffee and I'd love to give her my favorite coffee. And so 
that was where that idea was born. And I just, and it would, to me, after that initial, when Nicole told me that, that initial thing was like, ah, it's not real. It's not going to happen. That can't happen. And then she was like, oh no, I'll put you in contact with NASA food labs because we had to send them an instant version of our coffee because all food has to be freeze dried. Right which space. we had to develop. Yep. Yeah. So we, so we developed that. And you, then you have to send it to the food labs and the food labs have to do a bunch of tests on it to make sure it's okay for the, the thing. And I'm literally emailing NASA food labs still going, this isn't real. <laughs> this isn't happening. This isn't real. And we're really going to be up, up there. Packets, packets of our, of death so, coffee. So it's not just the world's strongest coffee anymore. It's not. It's, <laughs> The solar system's strongest coffee. Song, strongest as coffee as in the know. solar system. <laughs> I think, I, I just, I can't believe how cool uh, just a random conversation turned into reality kind of thing. But, I mean, from somebody who literally you created this product because your customers wanted a strong cup of coffee. And you're like, you know what, I can do that. And you started thinking about it and you came up with the name Death Wish. That was, was that ever on your mind? We're gonna go into space with this thing? No, absolutely not. Especially with the name Death Wish. Right. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> wow, it's it's pretty incredible. This this brand has done some incredible things. This is up there. This is really up there. Um, you know, I, I really I'm looking forward to seeing pictures of, you know, our new our new I know community member, our new coffee drinker. Yeah, uh, drinking this coffee up in space. Yeah, they have, to, they have to repackage it in, um, and hopefully we'll have a picture of this that I can, I can put up. Um, but they almost look like big Capri sun bags because all, all of the drinks that they drink are freeze-dried, and you have to be able to put a water tube into the into the bag to, to you know make it soluble, and then they have a straw that's like all attached to it that they basically drink hmm. whatever drink that they're going to drink out of it. It was funny, in the 70s, um, a couple beer companies wanted to get on the train and they wanted to send beer to astronauts in space and the Russians loved it obviously oh, you know cool, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and so did the Americans and so they were really excited about it not knowing that to do it you'd have to freeze dry it not only it was a different type of freeze drying so when it got to space all of the carbonation was gone. So it was the flattest, most disgusting <laughs> beer. So like the astronauts were immediately like, never again, no more beer. We don't want this. Like, Well, I got to say the one thing that really surprised me now, I haven't drank too much instant coffee in my life, maybe once or twice. And it's horrible. Yeah. It's generally, generally yeah. terrible. Um, and the stuff that we got back. Uh, that was made of Death Wish. I was just blown away. I was like, I could drink this every day if I had to, which makes me happy because now people in space now get to enjoy an awesome cup of coffee thanks to Death Wish Coffee. So my my question to you, Mike, is is do you plan to pursue looking into an instant version? I would love to hear from everyone. I would love to hear you know the. The community's response to this. Would you like an instant coffee? I, I have friends that, you know, they go camping or they go hiking. Right. You know, they go on these treks, they're, they're boating, and, they, you know, they don't, can't bring a coffee maker with them. So they do bring instant coffee, and they're like, yep, Mike, wish, wish we had your coffee up there. It's not the same. And this instant coffee we have is dead on. So, yeah, I mean, it's very possible. But I mean, I'm going to listen to everyone. Um, Really kind of weigh the options. Yeah, yeah, weigh yeah. the options, but I think it's it's definitely possible. We can do it. Obviously, we've proven we can do it. Yeah, sending it, doesn't, it to space. It <laughs> doesn't just have to be for space, even though it's pretty cool that it's in space. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I know another big uh, proponent of instant coffee is, uh, and I learned this actually working at this company, that um, Asia, that is uh, a, a lot of the coffee community in Asia, is is they, they enjoy a, a, an instant version of, of coffee rather than, you know, a drip a drip method. And um so I mean, there's there's a there's a whole market out there for it. I too. actually just sent some to my friend. Shout out to Zane. Uh, he's in Hawaii. He's on the Big Island, right next to the big volcano. And Come I was on. like, "Well, <laughs> dude, if the power goes out and the shit hits the fan, you'll have coffee." <laughs> so wow. I sent him some instant coffee. Did he send you pictures from out there? Uh, no, not yet. I think he just got the package. So, wow. uh, but he has sent me pictures of the volcano glowing in the, the really? it glows oh. in the night. Oh, you can my God. see it glow in the night. But anyways. The, the question is to the community, I guess, do you want to drink the same coffee that the astronauts in space are drinking? Yeah. So yeah. let us know. Um, you know, send us a comment. Hit us up on uh, Instagram yeah. or, or any social media. And uh, maybe this is something uh, you'll see in the future. Yeah. Death Wish Space Coffee. Oh, so cool. Cool. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. 
This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.